Today I'm in Athens where I'm going to take to the studio space of two artists who have made this historic city their home for the past few years. James Fuller and Anna Gonzalez Noguchi's work oozes with layers of meaning and of a highly detailed and technically exquisite practice. In this video, we talk about the advantages and disadvantages of being based here in Athens. And we're also gonna head over to Pet Project, where they've installed their latest exhibition, Portable Elastic Temple. We began by talking about their time at art school. It, there was a, there's a point uh, on like the first day or the second day where they're like, you're doing these group activities and they're like, oh, oh by the way, uh, at some point go and like, put your name on the wall and that'll be your studio for the year. We were next to each other and we've shared studios basically ever since then. People are in that space looking for those opportunities, you know, looking to collaborate with people. You naturally form groups with different people that you just align well with. We have so much crossover and it means that we share everything. There's nothing I might need that she's also not going to need. If you mm. have these like material heavy practices and you have a lot of processes and other things, you're like folding into the work that you're making. How are we going to continue that? So between when you left the Royal College and then here, I think that was a, a year gap. Uh, it was Maybe pretty rapid. Yeah, it, was it was quite pretty rapid. rapid. It had to be. It was in our last year at RC that we sort of came to visit. Off of quite a gut instinct. <laughs> we were like, okay, I think this is it. We took a bit of a chance. That, that gap was actually quite tough. You know, in that time, there was a lot of preparation involved because we wanted to sort of move here, but also moved here already pretty well equipped, you know, so that we could sort of get straight into it and really start producing. We spent quite a lot of time like, thinking, like, okay, what like secondhand tools do we need to gather and all of those sort of things in order to be able to like set up quickly. Idle time is really the enemy for me, you know, like when you have to start again, you almost feel like every time you're starting, you're starting from zero and it takes some time to build back the intensity and the energy and the confidence to start putting these things back out into the world. When you're, you're doing a big move like this, okay, we need to get going yeah. fast. You've gone from the RCA, which gives you momentum in the terms of yeah. like visibility and networks, to then lose that momentum by disappearing for a year is actually quite significant. Not ideal. Yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> you, sort of, you sort of want to have this continuation, but also have like a totally fresh start in a way where you can really just be like, okay, this is the next chapter. Like Here we're building our lives, but also the practice of what it means to make work and everything is different now than it was then. Mm. It feels like 15 years ago. In 2019, I asked Anna to make a solo show. Just at the moment they were making the move to Athens, which unwittingly became a way for them to explore how to make artwork in the city. So basically, after six months, we sort of ended up loading a van and we drove from your parents' we saw, place. We saw Stonehenge and then the, yeah, the so Acropolis. We, yeah. we ended Same up, journey. It was a very blurry We ended up being then, yeah. totally loaded up. Also a bit scary at the time because I thought maybe we were going to break down or something. It was not a very new van. It um, felt important to make that journey, but it was also practical. Things are different here than they are in the UK and in surprising ways. Tools are very cheap in the UK, you know, like... There's secondhand a, There's tools. a lot of secondhand tools. Here, our studio sync here is from Oxford University. It makes sense that while we had the time and also the focus, mm. we take that and we build it into the van and it doesn't actually take up any volume because you can pack in yeah. the sink, <laughs> pack under the sink. So when we arrive, someone like you goes, oh, Anna, do you want to make this show in like these two huge warehouses? It can You're be... You're ready already. It can be done. That show at Costa Coastal was like the first thing that I worked on. And that was sort of a really good way to sort of like test the city out and see like, I need to buy steel. Okay, where am I gonna go do that? And just like sort of working out how the city works. You sort of adapt your practice slightly, maybe like to making things more flat packed, things that can fold away into a much smaller scale and then be expanded out into once you like arrive. I sort of like that anyways, because also on a practical level, being able to break down and make it small is quite useful. Otherwise you have big storage issues. But then also like within my practice, modularity, and the sort of flat pack nature of things that's already sort of within my way of working. What I realized was just like the proximity of things. Yeah, it's very industrial, but also people are really happy to just take on your job even if it's like quite a small one. People are really generous with their time here. They want to see, oh, we haven't done that before. We don't know how, let's, mm. let's try it. Let's try it. As an artist, you're always the smallest job. You really want to make this and just one of these, please. Well, normally that costs just so much more yeah. than it would to make a hundred. We want to make this one, but actually not sure if it's going to work. We need to yeah. try it out. It's so important to be able to access different scales as yeah. an artist, different businesses who will work with you in different ways. 
Next, we headed to a nearby neighborhood in Kipsley, where they just installed their latest show together. We're in a space called Pet Projects, which is run by an artist called Angelo Plassens. I think we just came to one of the shows. He suddenly got introduced to our work and a bit curious, and then quite last minute he asked us to, if we'd be interested in making the show together. He has sort of this like pet manifesto, and so like all the exhibitions that he's done are sort of based off of pet. Our title of the show is Portable Elastic Temple which stands for pet. But then the rest is very loose, very fluid and very open. So we could kind of select works from different periods of time, actually over quite a long duration. The works, they share space and share uh, production, but it's, it's different to show the works together. Well, and to see our work like quite close to us, like where our studio is, sort of like a parallel neighborhood. It's so luxurious to be showing in the neighborhood where you're producing the work. Mm. It just changes everything like totally radically. I think I cast like the silicon work like two days before we finished the install yeah. or something. Actually I've been thinking about doing this and actually I have the time to do it and we can literally take it from the studio in amongst the other things we're doing and bring it here. Because the time frame you know, it has to be kind of reactive and that's also nice. As much as like we said that oh, it's great to have like a really long lead time. As long of a lead time as possible. But if it happens naturally and like uh, you can be, you can still feel happy about the, the that. You know? So I guess this is sort of a ongoing series of work that I've been producing, but it was sort of nice to actually like produce some more for this show. They're all called sort of Mino playlist number one, Mino playlist 13, based on like the number of the song. So it's actually based off of a karaoke playlist that my grandfather wrote of 94 songs. I mean, your playlists are sort of like folk songs, actually, so they're often very specific to a certain local area in Japan. During our show at Costa Coastal, I had like shown like maybe the actual book of it, and like I always thought, oh, what will this become? And sort of like this is an output of that. These are actually staples, almost like a pack of staples, but rearranged in a different way. Each work is sort of based off of one song. Because I often engrave surfaces, I basically remove the top layer to reveal actual like pattern and iconography and these are sort of like based off of some of the old Japanese vinyls of the song. In terms of like this sort of removal of material, it's something that sort of came from looking into like Japanese woodcut. You have this removal process to reveal an image and that's something that's filtered through a lot of different works within my practice. All of these uh, different ways of like handling a line or drawing, they're taken from abandoned patterns. You have to maintain a pattern, it has to be a maintenance fee, you know, it's not something which you can, you protect once. If they're not maintained, they get kind of released and you can find them. And what's important is that they're kind of contemporary documents, even if they're quite archaic objects like an axe. It's the idea that like people are trying to still like refine and protect archaic objects that have been manufactured for a thousand years already. How productive that is for people to be having so much control. The lightly scored or lightly engraved mixed textile wadding used often in uh, spring mattresses. The cheap recycled layer that stops the feeling of the spring in your back. They're all kind of like loosely bound by a thematic of survival. So like different things to maintain like bodily function in like drastic circumstances. I wanted to use the drawings to manipulate them harder, you know, like to let them be like free and roam. And that's why they start to become like more involved with a sensation of embroidery. So this uh, is quite hard to invest. It totally depends on what angle you are with the work, but actually it says some Tokyo, which is the name actually of a specific orchid which is sort of like an obsession that my grandfather had, but that, that obsession has sort of been passed on to me. So I've engraved a sort of collage in which the text sort of reveals and conceals itself depending on how you move and how the light hits. And then there's just sort of this secondary process in which you get this really colorful surface coming through. All my work is sort of based off of this site in Japan, both dealing with like this sort of creative process and hobbies within my family history, but then also within their professional practice of being like professional medical practitioners. These sort of little logos are actually coming all from these like medical pharmaceutical brands. Everything's sort of processed in the studio until like there's a point of where 
I get like the second coating, the layer of where you get these iridescent colors. A lot of my work will actually sort of come through like my own personal documentation of the space and then they'll be transformed into different surfaces that maybe feel quite far from like the original way that I've first taken them. And actually like the camouflage surface of this one Japanese weed called Dokudami that has this like medical purpose of healing. But then at the same time, it also has this amazing ability to just like inhabit all like disused spaces. The English is appearing here because it's mm. like a trademarked uh, orchid. Different like international hybrids that then become like brands. Yeah. And that's how actually like English is infiltrating all of these kind of like personal notebooks. I've always had this sort of like strange like distant relationship between uh, my like Japanese side uh, because I've both physically been very distant from it but also like for a long time I haven't really been able to communicate. I'm still not completely fluent and I can't totally read everything. My way around it is like looking also at like the actual imagery of like those vinyls and stuff like that. It's very close to me, I guess. The show at PET is kind of unique because we're showing works from different time periods, works from different moments together, even though they've been made in the same space and alongside each other. It's like keeping things close to you, but being able to see them quite differently. There'll be people who follow Anna's work who have like zero idea that I exist, yeah. and that's totally good. You know? <laughs> we also yeah. have like really huge differences. You work so much more rapidly than I do. <laughs> I'll leave the studio for a day or two and I come back. She'll take like a pack of staples and make some works. And I'll have been working on something in the corner for ages. And then someone will come to the studio and like they'll neck break down to that new staple thing. <laughs> She's just uh, having these different outputs that can appear quite suddenly, but they're part of a much longer durational thing. Yeah. You take a lot of solidarity from the idea that someone very close to you is also spending a lot of time like working out how this pack of staples becomes a work which is communicating something more than the pack of staples. I don't really have like one method of, in which I produce the work. I sort of can acknowledge that the outcome might feel quite defined and finished. Actually, there is quite an intuitive nature in which works happen. Even if it's sort of originating from one very specific place, it manifests itself in many different ways. Whether that be like very little minute bottle caps or things that are like really small bits of stationery, little notes from different notebooks, magnets that I've perhaps made or that are pre-existing also serve a function to hold up maybe a little note of a specific moment in time. My work might like seem quite different in terms of how it aesthetically looks, but it's like processing this one site in a very many different ways. Both of us kind of tried to use processes and technology in, in a way where it's not necessarily so felt. You know, you don't necessarily know how something has been manufactured. If you like hand over everything to someone just to fabricate for you, sometimes there are moments that you're producing something, you're like, oh, actually, I really like this. And that becomes, that moment becomes a different work entirely. You lose that moment if someone else is doing that for you. This work is, it was made from like stitched silicon skins to produce these visually complex hollow objects. All of the harsh edges, all of the collisions are all from a very manual process of stitching the silicons together. At the very end, you receive this object that has no previous like visualization. That's a very like manual process. And in a lot of my works, I'm trying to thread this kind of ambiguous heady line between something which is extremely visually complex and has a kind of digital sensation, but it's still a kind of one-to-one -one, uh, information transfer from original objects and from original surfaces. If we were to crack it open now, you would see also like the rotation of the, the wax inside of the thing would have a kind of smooth guts, but obviously this kind of very graphical, textured, rough outside with these heavy seams. This is really bad. This should be really clean. <laughs> one, one of my questions was about like showing, not here. How have you found that working out in terms of like, you know, you had your networks in, in London especially, and then obviously usually what happens is people in London want to show you. I'm sure that there have been opportunities and shows and stuff that we haven't been put in because people are worried, even about asking the question of like, oh, what, we, what if we don't have money to ship? And you're always going to have that. You will also have that if you're like uh, somewhere else in England, you know, it's also not free to move work around, you know, it costs artists money. Mm. It's more challenging now, 
with inflation wow. and yeah. after Brexit. Sharing locally here, like that's been super nice to like be able to engage with a totally different scene. Yeah, of course there was a concern of feel quite disconnected from like people that you know and all of the art world you may be new. Moving to Athens is not the solution for like every artist. It's all about like finding like your own formula that works for you. Finally, we talked about their future goals, both in terms of the studio and their artwork. And as with every artist I've interviewed, I always want to know what advice they would give to their younger selves. One of the challenging things when we, when we arrived here was this idea that we were always going to be leaving again at some point, and it became this race to try and get as much done mm -hmm. and like feel like you developed your work in the time that you had. People would think the time in Greece must pass slowly, but it goes like this. It's really crazy. It can be quite intense being an artist in a way because you're always setting yourself your own goals to like produce a certain work and there might be just short-term little things within your own practice that you want to achieve. Not even like in terms of a professional level, in terms of like where you want to show. It's like also just about like your own like self-reflective goals as just an artist. I feel like the tools that we're using for disseminating work and getting it out there are not functioning as well for artists as they could. But that's a large part of it, especially if you're somewhere outside of what people like to call the centres. <laughs> Yeah. It's like, uh, it's a big thing. Do you have advice for younger artists or advice that you would give yourself as a younger artist that you didn't know then and you do know now? Definitely don't take advice from old people. <laughs> You know, like, uh, Who's that? Everyone in general, <laughs> like, come on, like every generation that's going is like uh, been more destructive than the, the previous, right? Also, like, look after yourselves, your young selves. Sculpture is such a physical activity. There's so much bending over a table, like doing this little, you know, you don't have to be, you're not making like super big, heavy, macho stuff, it still kills your back. I would recommend working with artists. Find artists who would doing well and you really you like their work and they're yeah. working in a good spirit you can take so much from that to take forward us coming here has worked for us but it's not necessarily like the solution for everyone else like it's about figuring out your own system it obviously helps to like get advice from people and like sort of look at how other people have done it but it's also like replicating it and just like copying it isn't always like the right solution like you have to figure out how you can like reshift a balance so that you're focusing on like what you want to do and like that being productive for yourself in your own way